welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, welcome to everyone joining us online and welcome to everyone who's uh, here with me tonight. Uh, tonight we carry on with our uh, series of Journey to Faith. Uh, we are in Lesson 84 and tonight it's titled The Evil King of Syria and the Abomination of Desolation, both terms from the Book of Daniel. Uh, last uh, week we were following uh, the descendant in the genealogy of Jesus called Eleazar and tonight uh, we're going to continue on and I'll explain as we go but first before we launch into the uh, story and what's happening what events are occurring uh, we just always put this up at the beginning uh, to give us some uh, background everything that we're teaching is from the genealogy of Jesus the genealogy of Jesus is the first thing that we come across in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 1. And uh, in chapter 1, uh, after verse 12, we have the list of the descendants after the exile to Babylon. So currently, we've moved all the way down here to Eleazar, and so what we find is that Eleazar is in fact the great-great-grandfather of Jesus. So we are working our way through 40 descendants, and we're getting very, very close now to the time of Jesus. Now, the rulers that are in play at the point in time of Eleazar, um, they are predominantly, they start off Egyptian, and then the Seleucid Empire takes over them from the north, so the king of the north and the king of the south. And we last week went through several of these changes, and we end up with the evil a uh, king called Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and he is ruling uh, the Seleucid Empire to the north, which is based in Antioch, which I'll show on a map in a moment. Now, what happened is that we find that there's a revolt that's occurring, and it's going to occur from amongst these uh, this Jewish family who are uh, priests, and they're a rural priest, and again, I'll explain this tonight. So what this says here is that independent Judea occurs in 164 BC. So it's not the whole of Judea, but it's a certain area of it because they actually start to fight back against the Seleucid Empire. And so um, the father of that family uh, starts the revolt and then his son called Judas, who's on the chart here, continues to lead this revolt. So all of these people who are listed now on this chart are actually all Jewish leaders. No longer are they um, Greek leaders or Persian leaders or Babylonian uh, leaders from the past. Now this map explains the current situation that we find Eleazar living in and the Seleucid Empire, which is one of the fragments of the former Greek Empire, uh, it put its capital up at this place called Antioch. So Antioch is to the north of Jerusalem and hence they're called, they're called the King of the North. Egypt, of course, is to the south and so the king uh, that rules Egypt is known as the King of the South. So Jerusalem and Judea is in between the two. Uh, in last week's lesson we explained how this territory was formerly governed by the Egyptian Empire and now they're under the governance of the Seleucid Empire. And so we see a shift whereby the, uh, the home of God's people is smack in the middle between two factions who are trying to overrun each other and take over the former Greek Empire for themselves. Okay, and I'll leave that picture up uh, for us to start and I'll come back to that in a moment. So last week, the last scripture that we had a look at was from the book of Daniel. And all of this is found in the book of Daniel in chapter 11. And so all of the prophetic words which explain what goes on in the Bible between the end of the known books of the Bible and the New Testament are basically all prophesied in the book of Daniel. And so as we're traveling through history and following the descendants of Abraham through to Jesus, we find that the word of Daniel tells us what's happening, how it's going to happen, and history <coughs> reveals the specific people that it talks about. 
So in Daniel chapter 11, verses 30 to 31, we got to this point where the archangel Gabriel gave the word of the Lord to Daniel, and it said, Then he will turn back in a rage and try to destroy the religion of God's people. He will follow the advice of those who have abandoned that religion. Some of his soldiers will defile the temple. They will stop the daily sacrifices and set up the awful horror or the abomination of desolation, depending on your biblical version. So this particular person that we're talking about that will do this is Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes, and he is the king of the north who rules the Seleucid Empire. And so if you ask the question, what is the abomination of desolation? The answer is actually found elsewhere in the word of God. To the Jews, an abomination is anything involving the worship of other gods in sacred places. So that's key to understanding this scripture. An abomination is anything involving the worship of other gods in sacred places. There are several references to this in the Bible, but one of them which I've chosen is from the book of Ezekiel in chapter 5, verse 11. So it says, Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will withdraw my favour. And so the key words in there are defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images. This is an abomination to the Lord. So the term abomination of desolation is a Hebrew expression meaning hateful destroyer. The destroyer in this instance is Antiochus IV, Epiphanes of the Seleucid Empire. So the story at present was that Antiochus had gone down to Egypt with his ambitions to overtake the Egyptian Empire and a Roman, uh, the Roman Senate sent ambassadors to stop him from carrying out what he wanted to do. Anyone remember the story from last week, what happened? He was cut off by Roman emissaries who had arrived by boat from the Mediterranean and as he was marching into Egypt before he actually went in there properly, they stopped him and they said, we don't want you to go any further. He explained to them that their source of grain, wheat in particular, came from Egypt and they didn't want to have that at risk because it fed their population. And so for the Romans, this is the first instance in the Bible where we find their input comes in all the way through, of course, until the time of Jesus and after. So what they did is they said to him, we want you to make a decision. And Antiochus said, sure, I'll go and meet with my counselors and I'll get back to you. And so what did the uh, ambassador do? He drew a circle in the dirt or the sand around him and he said, you're not to leave that circle without making a decision. And so he realized that he was on the spot and he had to make that decision there and then. Why? Because if he had stood out of that circle and not agreed with them, the Romans were taking that as a declaration of war. And so he decided uh, that wasn't a good idea. And so he backed off and he said, sure, I'm not going to go ahead with what I was going to do. And so you can imagine he wasn't very happy. So he turns around and he's got to head back home, uh, up north to the Seleucid Empire, back to Antioch on the eastern side of the Mediterranean. And he's looking for a way to take out his anger. And so he sees the Jewish people and the Temple of Jerusalem, which has always been ripe pickings for treasures, for wealth. And he says, that's what I'll do. I'm going to go and do some damage on the way home and I'm going to vent my anger. And the scriptures talk about how he was enraged. And so we pick up with the story there and it goes that whilst Antiochus is busy invading Egypt in 168 BC, a false rumor spreads through Jerusalem that he has actually been killed. In the uncertainty that follows, Jason, the deposed high priest, who took refuge in the land of the Ammonites, gathers a force of 1,000 followers 
and decides that he's going to carry out a surprise attack on the city of Jerusalem. The attack is repulsed, but not before Menelaus, the high priest appointed by Antiochus, flees for his life. So in other words, the leader of the Seleucid Empire took out the uh, priest who was next in line. You might remember there was two sons who had a dispute. One was a Hellenized son, so he's aligned with the Greeks, and one was against the Greeks. So the one who was aligned with the Greeks, Jason, uh, became this role. But he was sending money up to the Seleucid Empire, and this fellow Menelaus, who was a priest, he took the money up one time and he said, I'll give it to you, ruler, if you allow me to be the high priest instead. And he agreed, and so Jason was deposed. The point is, is that the priests in those days, they weren't priests as we see them. They were more like a government official who had greater powers. And so Menelaus, when he went in, he didn't really go in as a Jewish priest who was concerned with the affairs of God. He went in as a Jewish priest, but he was concerned with the affairs of the state. And so he was given powers to govern. So he wasn't just a priest, he was essentially a governor. And so uh, word of the surprise attack reaches Antiochus before he leaves Egypt and he immediately suspects the Jews are revolting. So basically Jason who was deposed, he came back to oust Menelaus because he heard that the ruler who allowed him to be in power had passed away, but it's not true. And so this uh, surprise attack that's launched with a thousand people reaches the Seleucid ruler before he leaves Egypt and he decides that the only thing that can be happening is the Jews are revolting. So the opportunistic Jason unwittingly started a sequence of events that not only devastates his own people, but fulfills the word of the Lord he should be familiar with. Now in rage, the humiliated Antiochus returns from Egypt and he attacks the city of Jerusalem. Menelaus is restored as high priest again. The treasury of the temple is looted. As I mentioned, he was always interested in the money and thousands of residents are killed. These events are detailed in the non-canonical books of the Maccabees. And so, as I've mentioned, we're teaching out of the books of the Maccabees. They're non-canonical. They are in some Bibles, in Orthodox and Catholic Bibles, but they're considered non-canonical because they're not part of the original Hebrew Bible. And so we're using this as a historical source of information about God's people and about what happens. And so reading from the first book of Maccabees in uh, chapter uh, 20, verse 25, it says, And after that Antiochus had smitten Egypt, he returned again and went up against Israel and Jerusalem with a great multitude and entered proudly into the sanctuary, the sanctuary, of course, is the temple of Jerusalem and took away the golden altar and the candlestick of light and all the vessels thereof. And when he had taken all away, he went into his own land, having made a great massacre and spoken very proudly. Therefore, there was a great mourning in Israel in every place where they were. And in the second book of Maccabees, in chapter 5, verses 11 to 14, it says, when these happenings were reported to the king, he thought that Judea was in revolt. Raging like a wild animal, he set out from Egypt and took Jerusalem by storm. He ordered his soldiers to cut down without mercy those whom they met and to slay those who took refuge in their houses. There was a massacre of young and old, a killing of women and children, a slaughter of virgins and infants, in the space of three days, 80,000 were lost. Three days, 80,000 were lost. 40,000 meeting a violent death and the same number being sold into slavery. And so this is the impact of his rage when he gets rebuffed by the Romans heading down to Egypt to contest the Egyptian empire. So returning to the book of Daniel, it says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 33, the first portion, part A, as we would normally call it, Daniel 11, 33, part A, it says, wise leaders of the people will share their wisdom with many others. 
And so this seems like a bit of an odd statement in the midst of it all, but it's obviously very true. So the wise leaders of the people will share their wisdom with other people. And we're going to see what that means as the story unfolds. So the twice deposed Jason, the, f- the former high priest, he escapes again and ends up in Sparta in Greece to the west. Never to return, he dies and he's buried there. So he now is out of the picture. So going to Daniel 11 verse 36, it continues, The king of Syria will do as he pleases. He will boast that he is greater than any god, superior even to the supreme god. He will be able to do this until the time when God punishes him. You may notice that the details have changed. Originally, when we start chapter 11, it talks about the king of the south and the king of the north. What you see now is it talks about the king of Syria. Why is that? It's because his capital was moved to Antioch in Syria. And so now it references where he's actually ruling from, the king of Syria. Okay, so this is the change that we notice there. And finally, we we learn what the abomination of desolation is in Daniel 11, verse 38. When the archangel Gabriel reveals that Antiochus IV will honour the God who protects fortresses. So the scripture portion reads, Instead, he will honour the God who protects fortresses. So if you've ever done any study on the pantheon of gods, you'll see that Each god is given a role, if you will. Someone is the god of thunder. Someone else is the god of war. Someone else is the god of fertility and so on. And so this reference in the book of Daniel is saying that the particular abomination of desolation is the god who protects fortresses. And so if we look up the Greek pantheon and we look at which god was the god of protecting fortresses, It's there in history for us to see. So the God who protects fortresses is a reference obviously to a Greek God. So let's hear what the Seleucid king does to earn him the title of an evil king. And let's learn which Greek God the king will honor. So Antiochus reverses his father's policies. He imposes a tax on the temple of Jerusalem. You may remember his father before him allowed them to continue to practice their worship of God and to practice their tax system and not have to pay taxes every seven years, etc. So he turns around and he reverses this. He establishes a new fortress and he issues public notices or decrees to repress the Jews from observing the laws of God given through Moses. These measures were bad for the Jews and were aimed at increasing control But then the Seleucid government desecrates the temple by placing an idol of Zeus there. And so I'm going to introduce to you Zeus Olympius, the god of fortresses. If you look down the bottom here, you will see representation of human beings down here. So it gives you an understanding of the sheer scale of this statue that was placed there in the temple. And so suddenly in God's house, we have this monstrosity here. And in this hand is held Artemis, which is another God. And uh, as you can see, it's a female God. And so suddenly everything's changed. The place of worship for the God of Israel has now been usurped and they've placed a false God into the temple, which of course fulfills prophecy, okay? That the temple would be defiled and the description of defiling a temple, of course, is the abomination of desolation as we spoke about. So Antiochus now orders people to worship this Zeus as the supreme God. And Hellenic priests are brought in to take over the temple and institute their own form of worship. So if you were going to church one day and someone walked in and put a statue of some false god in your church and said, that's it, everything you believe, practice and worship 
is no longer you are now going to do as i say and you're going to worship this what do people do we have a mixture there's some who are going to revolt and there's others who are going well i don't want any conflict i don't want to get hurt i don't want to be personally affected so i'll just switch and i'll worship whatever they say as long as they leave me alone true of the world so the priests what do they begin to sacrifice what's forbidden to be sacrificed or eaten in judaism pigs Pigs. and so what do the greeks do they sacrifice pigs in the temple they do this with a flagrant disregard and know it is strictly forbidden on the altar of god it is however the sacrifice they offer to greek gods in their religious practice but it doesn't stop there they aren't just interested in imposing their religion, but as the Archangel Gabriel said to Daniel, they are determined to destroy the religion of God's people, as it says in Scripture. So circumcision, God's covenant command to all males, is now forbidden. To possess or read the Torah and Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament today, the Word of God, is now forbidden. To observe the Sabbath is now forbidden again as the archangel gabriel said to daniel the daily sacrifices are stopped and forbidden jewish leaders are required to sacrifice to idols the awful horror or the era of the abomination of desolation has begun and failure to obey is met with disciplinary execution meaning that to disobey what is forbidden is penalized by death how would you go today if someone did that to you if you continue to practice your faith you will be killed and you can see in these times they have no compunction whatsoever they would be very happy to do it they wouldn't think twice about it so how would we go if that was you and i today it's very challenging isn't it so if we ask why does this happen or what motivates or so what motives Antiochus uh, to take these actions or motivates it is unclear maybe he is annoyed with the overthrow of Menelaus maybe he is responding to a perceived Jewish revolt maybe he's encouraged by pro-Hellenic support maybe he is incensed by support for Ptolemy by the Romans and maybe he's just infuriated by the interference of the Roman Republic what we do know is that to consolidate his empire and strengthen his hold over the region, Antioch decides to take sides with the Hellenized Jews, those who have abandoned that religion, as the scriptures say, as the Archangel Gabriel described to Daniel. And therefore, this must be, and this is the challenging part, God's plan for his people. In 1 Maccabees, chapter 1 verse 50 it says they also added that whoever did not obey the word of the king will die, would die and so the contemporary scriptures that were written at the time confirm that they would be killed so they either practice what the greeks say or they're going to be executed so the punitive executions given out under the rule of antiochus are clarified by the jewish historian Josephus, who states that those who don't accept Hellenization were in fact, how did he kill them? What do you think I'm going to say? Sacrifice, cross, crucifixion. Crucifixion. Now we find out when we look at history, a lot of people don't seem to realize this. They think it's something of the Romans and something of Christ. But crucifixion has happened for a long time. In fact, in the time of Moses, scriptures talk about people being hung on a post. Crucifixion. Crucifixion has been around from the dawn of time almost. What happened was it changed in terms of how they crucified them. And so our image today, of course, is how the Romans crucified, and that is on a cross. But we find here, at this particular point in time, that the Temple of Jerusalem if people turned away from God, they were going to be crucified. 
much later in history we find out that Jesus went and he was crucified to restore people's relationship back to God. And so we see this synergy between the two events. So the fear of accepting Hellenization or being put to death on the cross under Seleucid rule is too much for many people. So they abandon God's laws and the Jews become divided. Now for the first time since being released from captivity in Babylon, the strict living and obedience to God's laws are challenged and the faith of the Jewish people starts to deteriorate. The Archangel Gabriel said to Daniel, he will be able to do this until the time when God punishes him, the scripture that we just read. And so we see in this, what? Until the time when God punishes him. So in other words, it's sort of allowed to go on until God decides this is his time. And so once again, hard scripture to read. So the Hellenic Jews refer to this statue of Jews as Baal Shemin, which means the Lord of Heaven. And so they place their God Zeus and call him the Lord of Heaven. God, for many, many parts of history, was always talked about as the God of Heaven, even in Scripture. Mm. Okay. So here they are saying now that he's the Lord of Heaven. But as you would expect, the majority of Jews refuse to worship Zeus as they consider it an anathema. Now the word anathema, if you haven't heard it before, means an idol devoted to evil. Okay, so that's the word used to describe those who worship an idol devoted to evil. So Antiochus sends in an army to enforce his decree, destroy much of the city and slaughter many Jews. To consolidate his hold, monitor events on the Temple Mount and safeguard the Hellenized faction in Jerusalem, he then stations a Seleucid garrison in the city that is confirmed in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 33 to 36. And it reads, Then they built the city of David with a great and strong wall and strong towers. And it became their citadel, which in Greek is the word Acre. They placed there a sinful nation of lawless men and they became strong within it and they laid up weapons and provisions and gathered together the spoils they had taken from Jerusalem. Then they returned there and were like a great snare. It became an ambush against the sanctuary, an evil accuser against Israel continually. So I'm going to put the next screen up behind me. It's got two components to it. Firstly, which I'll mention now, is this picture here. This, in fact, is a picture of the Seleucid king sitting on a throne in the background. In the foreground, there's a lady here, and there's all these bodies on the ground. Now, what's happening here is that people are being turned into martyrs for their cause. In other words, they're refusing to do what they've been told to do. And so a family of Jewish rule of a Jewish rule peace priest called Mattathias of Moden will lead a rebellion. I'll just change sides here. Will lead a rebellion. So that hasn't happened yet. But before this happens, a mother with seven sons is arrested, and the sons are all commanded to eat pork. They refuse, so Antiochus subsequently tortures and kills each of them in front of their mother. So can you imagine the appalling situation these people find themselves in? They're no longer free to practice. They are now subjugated to abandon God. And so there's those who will and those who won't. Of course, when stuff like this starts happening, people realize they have no control under the authority of the Seleucid Empire. And so they've got two choices. Change or fight against them. And this is what happens. Now this picture here, this is a picture of the southern wall of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem that I took. And what we find here, you might see this sort of cavernous point over here, is that they excavated a cistern, a storage place for water. 
uh, and it's found beneath the Accra next to the Temple Mount. So in other words, these scriptures, there's evidence to support that they build this fortress. And so this is that cistern underneath. So here's the Temple Mount, and here's the underneath this, this uh, uh, remains of the stone structures, is the remains of the Accra or the fortress that was built there. So just to fill in the details, the name Accra comes from the Greek word Acropolis, where the word polis means city. So combined together, it describes a fortress city or a tall fortified place overlooking a town. And so we can see from this picture, when they said they built a fortress right next to the temple, they literally built it right next to the temple. Right, toe to toe, stone to stone. Okay. So this uh, fortress that was built for the people of Jerusalem, the word came to symbolize anti-Jewish paganism, a fortress for the impious and wicked. Dominating both the city and the surrounding countryside, it was occupied not only by Greek garrison, but by their Jewish supporters as well. So there's those who supported them. Daniel chapter 11 again, verse 39 this time, says of Antiochus IV, to defend his fortresses, he will use people who worship a foreign god. So those people who worship a foreign god, this is from the point of view of the Seleucid ruler. And so what he's talking about are the Jewish people who worship the God of Israel. He says he will use people who worship a foreign god. He will give great honour to those who accept him as ruler, put them into high offices and give them land as a reward. So if I'm a Jewish person living in this land, if I do what they want me to do, I end up in a high office with a great pay and lots of land to go with it. And so I become a wealthy and affluent person by abandoning God. In Daniel 11, verse 33, so just going back a little bit, part B through to verse 35, so Daniel 33, verse 33 to 35 in Daniel 11, it reads, But for a while some of them will be killed in battle or be burnt to death, and some will be robbed and made prisoners. While the killing is going on, God's people will receive a little help. Even though many who join them will do so for selfish reasons, some of those wise leaders will be killed, but as a result of this, the people will be purified. This will continue until the end comes, the time that God has set. So, let's bring life to what that means. Whilst Antiochus was busy making the lives of the Jews miserable, a king called Mithridates from Parthia, which is in today's northeastern Iran, attacked and seized the city of Herat, which is in today's West Afghanistan, in 167 BC. And so here comes a map. So this is Parthia over here. This is Herat, which was named, had its name changed to Alexandria over here. Here is Antioch, where the ruler comes from. And of course, here is Jerusalem down here. And so what happens is they're busy down here. And suddenly they have a problem with Mithridates over here, who goes and attacks Herat over here. I'll tell you what the problem is. You probably won't uh, guess this unless you've uh, studied the history. The reason that this is critical is because it disrupts a direct trade route to India and it effectively splits the Greek world into two. Realising how dangerous this is, in other words, all of the trade and the supply that he was making taxes, etc. from, was going to be cut off. So Antiochus decides that he's going to lead his main army to contest these Parthians, but unwilling to give up control of Judea, he sends a commander called Lysias. Uh, I believe his name is here, Lysias. Now he's a general and governor from Syria, which of course is the region where they're ruling from here. And he sends, he, he sends him uh, to lead the men that are left behind. And it's during his absence that those who resist his rule will fight back. So in other words, Antiochus goes and he sends a lesser army with this ruler. And so the people who are rebelling go 
fantastic. We've got less of an army to fight against. Keep in mind that little bit of scripture that I told you where it says, God's people will receive a little help. It is during his absence that those who resist his rule will fight back. The word of the Lord given by the archangel Gabriel in Daniel 11 verse 32 says, By deceit the king will win the support of those who have already abandoned their religion, but those who follow God will fight back. Daniel 11.32 So in other words, what's the deceit? The deceit is to give them land, give them power, give them position, title and wealth, worldly things. But he says that's for those who are going to abandon their faith. If you ever want to get someone to abandon something that they're doing or believe, give them lots of things and oftentimes they'll change. It's pretty common in this world. But it says that but those who follow God will fight back. So back in Judea, the Seleucid suppression of Jewish religious life is so severe that it eventually causes the resident population to resist. While Antiochus is occupied in the east during 167 BC, a rural priest called Mattathias of Moden raises a rebellion with his family against the Seleucid Empire. So here's this scripture that I've just mentioned, Daniel 11.32. By deceit, the king will win the support of those who have already abandoned their religion, but those who follow God will fight back. So Mattathias of Modin raises a rebellion with his family against the Seleucid Empire when a Greek official asked him to perform a Hellenic sacrifice. What do you think he asked him to do? He asked him to sacrifice a pig. Extraordinary, isn't it? All about pigs. And so he refuses. And he's so infuriated that he actually kills the Greek official. His family, whose surname is Maccabeus, become known as the Maccabees, for which the non-canonical books of scripture have been written. And so this is the origin of the name the Maccabees. Uh, I'll come back to my notes in a second. This other picture and name here is Judas Maccabeus, who's one of the sons, and he's going to assume leadership of the revolt when his father dies a little bit later, and he's going to liberate Jerusalem and reconsecrate the temple. So I'll return to the notes. The Maccabees called the Jewish people to fight a holy war against the Seleucids. And the sons of Mattathias, Judas, who's the eldest, Eleazar, John, Jonathan and Simon begin a military campaign in which both the Seleucid administration and the local Hellenized Jews fail to understand the scale of the revolt at hand. In the beginning, the campaign is a disaster for the Jews uh, because why? Because they refuse to fight on Shabbat, the Sabbath. And the Seleucid soldiers go ahead and kill 1,000 men, women and children just because they refuse to raise arms. The Jews rapidly learn that in order to survive, they must fight when attacked, even on the Sabbath. Kind of reminds you of Jesus in the fields, doesn't it? And he gets persecuted for allowing his disciples to take grain on the Sabbath. And he says, well, God doesn't want his children to starve. So in other words, being religious and observing things has a price to pay, which isn't something that God wants for his people either. So the father, Mattathias, dies in 166 BC. He's obviously elderly. And his eldest son, Judas Maccabeus, not only assumes leadership of the revolt, but liberates Jerusalem and re-consecrates the temple by 164 BC. Whilst this takes place, Antiochus IV is enjoying success early in his campaign to the east when he suddenly dies from disease in Babylon. And so Antiochus passes away whilst he's away from this conflict area. Now in the book of Daniel, history confirms the explanation of the vision given to Daniel by the Archangel Gabriel. The awful horror begins in 167 BC when Antiochus returns from Egypt, starts to massacre the Jews and defiles the temple of Jerusalem. 
This happens after the deposed high priest Jason, in the absence of the Seleucid king, revolts and attacks Jerusalem to remove Menelaus, who is installed as a Hellenic priest in his place. If we fast forward three and a half years to the year 164 BC, Jerusalem is liberated by Judas, Maccabeus and Antiochus IV suddenly dies of disease. This event fulfills the prophecy. The Jewish historian Josephus in his book The War of the Jews says Antiochus, who was called Epiphanes, surprised Jerusalem by force and held it for three years and six months. Now this is a really key understanding because I'm sort of summarizing what's happened but now we're actually going to tie it to the word of the Lord in the book of Daniel. So I'll repeat. Antiochus, who was called Epiphanes, as the Jewish historian Jephesus calls him, surprised Jerusalem by force and held it for three years and six months. Anyone know how many days that is? It's in the book of Daniel. 1,290 days that will pass from the end times prophecy of Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, part A. It is... 1290 days. Okay. Antiochus IV leads the main Seleucid army away to contest the Parthians to the east, who had cut the Greek trade route in 167 BC. The historian Josephus says he is cast out of the country by the Maccabees, but the word of the Lord says the completion of Jewish deliverance was set up to happen 45 days later. This again is found in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, this time part B, when it says, Happy are those who remain faithful until 1,335 days are over. Exactly 45 days longer. And so there's your two numbers from the prophecy. It's not something that's happening now or later. It's something that happened all the time back then. So 1290 days was the three years and six months that Jerusalem was under siege by force by the Seleucid king. 1335 days was the extra 45 days where the Seleucid king left Jerusalem and went to Parthia to fight against this foreign king and of course he died of disease. There we have the second part of the prophecy fulfilled. So a month on a, basically a month and a half later. So 1335 days after the temple of Jerusalem is desecrated, Antiochus the fourth days are over. And that is the fulfillment of the prophecy. So fulfillment of the prophecies in the book of Daniel allow us to understand the sudden death of Antiochus by disease is no accident. So in other words, if the Lord gave this word to Daniel through the angel Gabriel, it's not an accident. Who gave him the disease? It's God. We know from scripture and history that God gives disease, pestilence, drought, all of those natural phenomena that kill people. And so we find here that he is killed by disease, fulfilling prophecy specifically on exactly the same number of days. The slaughter of the 40,000 Jewish people and the sale of 40,000 to slavery is also no accident. As the archangel said in Daniel 11.33, that for a while some of them will be killed in battle or be burnt to death. Okay. And it also goes on to say, some will be robbed and made prisoners. So they're sold into slavery. And so the Bible reveals that all of these events that happened were prophesied before they happen. It says in Daniel 11 verse 35 that God uses the evil Antiochus IV as a means for his people to be purified. And it is here we receive a warning, not just for these times, but for all future time, which says this will continue to the end comes the time that God has set. So when we see what God calls purification, what he's doing is he's once again 
sorting out his people, his followers, his believers. Purification is used in the Bible. We've been talking about this on, on Sunday. You know, the Lord purifies us by the means of others who come against us. When you're put under oppression and something comes against you, you've got two choices. You either go down the wrong path and abandon God, or you stand with God. And so what happens to your heart in that moment? You are completely and utterly purified because you're put in a situation where your back's against the wall and you have to make a decision for God. Not a lukewarm, not a I go to church on Sunday, but this is it right now, for or against. And so it purifies us, it cleanses our heart because we have to have an absolute decision for the Lord. This verse, and you might find this strange, but it just struck me when I was reading this and, and writing and studying originally. This verse, Daniel 11, verse 35, which says, This will continue to the end comes, the time that God has set. What are we talking about? We're talking about the abomination of desolation. We're talking about God's house and God's people being destroyed. We're talking about people making choices to be separated from God. We're talking about God using other foreign people who observe foreign gods to oppress his own people in order to purify them. What happens as a result of this? You ever want to find out what your identity is? Be oppressed. See how you stand as a consequence of it. If you look at history past or events yet to come, when you question why do wars continue to rage around the planet? Why do mass genocides of ethnic cleansing occur? Obviously the worst of these that we know in history was six million Jews killed by Adolf Hitler in World War II. Today, bombs are being fired, missiles are being fired into Israel against God's people. Has anything change from what Daniel has prophesied so long ago. We see that things have not changed. What does the scripture say? Until the ends of time. Are we at the end of time yet? No. So we have this situation where mass genocides of ethnic cleansing occur. That's what's happening in Israel today. They want the Jews dead. They want them out. It's happened throughout history in most countries of the world. So why do people who worship false gods struggle is another question. Why do people kill one another in the name of God? We have battles today where one party is saying that they're doing this in the name of God against another party who's saying they're doing it in the name of God. Do you think God's in this? And yet people do all sorts of bad things and claim it in the name of God. The book of Job that we've just been studying. Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar. They spoke wrong about God and claimed that they were speaking right about God. At the end of the book of Job, the Lord says, you didn't speak right of me. And so they're asked to make a sacrifice, repent, and Job becomes their intercessor. There's nothing new going on here. Why does slavery or taking prisoners still exist? Does everyone believe the slave trade is over? Well, of course it's not. The African slave trade changed the culture and politics of the world over. There is issues all over the world today with racial problems because of the result of the African slave trade. America is obviously a classic case. It's still going on to this day. Nothing has changed. If we ever want to talk about fulfilling prophecy, this said that this will continue on. The story of the world today is spoken about in this one simple little verse in the book of Daniel. It's very profound if you think about it. In Daniel 11.32 it says, Those who have abandoned their religion will have consequences for supporting those 
who try to destroy the religion of God's people. Daniel 11.32 also says that those who remain faithful to God are those who will fight back. Mattathias of Modin and his family who came to be known as the Maccabees are those people. Instead of living in fear and abandoning their faith, they refused to sacrifice to pagan gods and the worship demanded of them, and instead, as the Archangel Gabriel reveals in Daniel 11.34, while the killing is going on, God's people will receive a little help. Perhaps this little help is the sudden death of Antiochus IV by disease. What's happened? The head of the snake has been removed. He was taken away from a distance. As soon as that happened, his army was reduced, his presence was reduced, and the people of Judea were able to revolt successfully. And so we can see a complete shift in the region as a result of that event. So you look at the Parthian king who attacked the king at Herat, and Antiochus went running. Then we look at God's plan. We see his hand all over this situation as he removed the players out of action, fulfilled the prophecies, and allowed a revolt to happen. What's significant in this is it only takes one person to make a stand sometimes. If no one will make a stand, no one will, will follow them. But when one person stands up righteously, other people are prepared to stand with them. And this is what happens here. So when news reaches Lysias that Antiochus IV is dead, so this is the general who's down in Judea, he assumes the office of regent and crowns the former king's nine-year-old son, Antiochus V Eupater. And so I have a couple of pictures here, one I'll explain in a moment. This is a coin that was minted of Antiochus V Eupater, so you can see what he looks like. Okay, we know he's a king because he's got the diadem, diadem on his head. The hostage, now you have to remember back in time, the hostage, the rightful heir Demetrius, who has been imprisoned by the Roman Republic, is now 22 years of age and he's his cousin, his crown. Remember the former king had a son and the Romans took him away as surety that the Seleucid would no longer attack. Okay, And so Demetrius, while all this has been going on, has been tucked away in Rome and he's not free to leave. But of course, he's the next in line. And so what happens in his absence? Seleucid king, who, who he was taken away from, dies now. And his now younger son gets put in place by this general. But he's still alive and he's in Rome. And so he hears of this. He's now 22 years of age and he is his cousin his crown. He requests the Roman Senate restore the Syrian throne to him, but his request is rejected because it's better for the Romans to have a boy in power with a regent than an adult with a motive to contest them. So the inhabitants of the new Acre fortress in Jerusalem are under siege from Judas Maccabeus, who is leading a force to take over the surrounding city. Appealing for assistance from the new young Seleucid king, an army is sent to put down the revolt. But as they approach Jerusalem from the south, they lay siege to a place called Beth Zur, the most powerful of Judean strongholds in the Battle of Beth Zur. And so this picture that's up here is actually of Beth Zur. So Beth Zur is west of Hebron in Israel, and you can see, oh that's a nice uh, typo, the jilltop, instead of the hilltop, <laughs> the jilltop dominates the highway. So it must have had a female ruler amongst that army. If you have a look, you can see the highway coming down from the north and it coming up from the south. And what happens? It's so steep here that it goes around either side. But what that means in terms of a place to fight, there's only one way through here. And of course, they are able to put lookouts up here and see if anyone's actually coming. They also have this situation where they have these two specific junctions and it's very steep, 
So how many people can come together and fight at one time? Mm. They can't do a traditional pitched battle. And that's what the Seleucids do. So Judas Maccabeus, he operates like a guerrilla warfare. And so what happens? This is an ideal setup. So they set and wait for them in this location. So also known as Beth Sura, it is strategically located on a hilltop, not a jilltop, dominating the highway between Jerusalem and Hebron to prevent any hostile army approaching. The approach of this new army causes Judas Maccabeus to abandon his siege of the Acre and face General Lysias in battle. And so I have a new map for you to have a look at. Uh, a few things on here to start off with. Modin, home of the Maccabees. Here it is located here to the site northwest of Jerusalem. So this is where they're located, where they come from. This green zone here represents the territory that's now controlled under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus. And so you can see it's not the full area that they should be having, but it is a portion of the hill country predominantly. General Lysias and the Seleucid army come down from Syria they come down and they come up from the south. Probably thought they would surprise them because instead of coming from the north, they go all the way around and come up from the south. So they come down the coastal highways, uh, which is nice and flat, and they come up here just to the west of Hebron, as that picture showed. Judas and the Maccabean army, they were in uh, Jerusalem. They were assaulting the Acre, trying to get the Greeks out of there at the time. And when they hear of this army coming up from the north, they decide they better abandon that for the moment and go down and contest this, uh, this army. There's two uh, items here. One says the Battle of Beth Zur, which is what we're talking about right now. And there's another battle which I'll come back to, which is called the Battle of Beth Zechariah. And uh, that's a separate and second battle. So, so he goes down to face General Osias in battle and he is actually defeated. The Maccabean army then returned to Jerusalem which in reality reminds them that their land is still under occupation. Because when they go back, the Seleucid forces still control the Acre, meaning they've got control of that portion of territory, but they still can't oust them out of the actual Acre itself. So General Osiris attempted to end the Maccabean revolt in Judea, but his failure is followed by more bad news when he learns a confidant who had accompanied the former Antiochus on his campaign to the east had been entrusted with the upbringing of his young son. This fellow is called Philip and General Lysias learns that the appointed regent of the son Antiochus V is returning to the capital Antioch as commander-in-chief with the other half of the Seleucid army intent on seizing power. So suddenly he's gone from thinking oh I'm going to take control of this kingdom to having somebody else returning from the east. So feeling threatened and wanting to go to Antioch, he advises the young Antiochus V to offer a peaceful, set, peaceful settlement with the Jews so that he can leave. This resulted in a compromise being reached whereby peace is exchanged for restoring religious freedom to the Jews. So that was their solution. This allows the Jews to live in accordance with God's laws and have the temple restored to worship the God of Israel. So of course the Jews are set. But to ensure they can't rise quickly again, on his way out, General Osias breaks his promise and pulls down the walls of Jerusalem before leaving. So in other words, he bought himself time to be able to get out of there. So Judas got wind of the rivalry between General Lysias and the challenging regent Philip and took advantage. And again, he lays siege to the fortress in late 162 BC. But what he didn't expect was the return of General Lysias before General Philip arrived in Antioch. General Lysias and his army approached Jerusalem from the south again and besieged Beth Zur, the first location we showed you. Judas received news and again he lifts his siege on the Acre and goes south again and this time he stopped at this second location marked here which is Beth Zechariah and another battle happens at that location. So he stopped at Beth Zechariah between General Isaias and Jerusalem and straddled his 20,000 strong army on high ground on the road to Jerusalem. 
Judas beat the Seleucid army in the Battle of Bethsur with guerrilla tactics, so this time he decides he will challenge them in a traditional head-on battle and stand directly in the path. So he changes tactics, he goes back down and he puts his army across the top and waits for him, thinking he'll have a pitched battle. But this is a grave mistake because Lysias is victorious and the Maccabean army is forced to draw back from the Battle of Beth Zechariah to Jerusalem. And in this battle, Judas loses his younger brother Eleazar in battle. Lysias returns to the Seleucid capital with Antiochus V, the young king, only to find that Philip's already there and in control. A battle is fought, Philip is killed, and control of Antioch and the Seleucid Empire is back in the hands of General Lysias and Antiochus. So they're the historical events that happen. Now in the same year, the Roman Senate hears the Seleucid Empire keeps more warships and elephants than agreed to in the Treaty of Apamea from 188 BC. So this is when they stop fighting earlier in history. So again, they send a Roman emissary to travel through the cities of Syria to cripple Seleucid military power by sinking warships and hamstringing their elephants. The, re the regent uh, General Lysias follows in the steps of Antiochus and he lets this happen. Remember Antiochus returned around uh, from Egypt and he listened to the Romans and he didn't go against them. So there's a fear against the Romans is what we get the picture through all of this. So when the Romans send the mystery and they do some damage to slow down the Seleucids where they see a threat, this fellow stands back and he lets it happen again. So the failure to oppose them enrages the Seleucid citizens in Syria so much so that they assassinate a Roman envoy called Gnaeus Octavius in Laodicea. At this point, Demetrius escapes from his confinement in Rome in defiance of the Senate and travels east to Syria and he kills the regent Lysias and his cousin Antiochus IV, sorry, the fifth, who is the young boy king. He's welcomed back in 161 BC as their true king and crowned Demetrius the first Sota. And so this is what he looks like. The word Sota means saviour. And so they said saviour because they see him as their saviour because he is the rightful king. And this is what he looks like. So he's now the, the son of Antiochus the fourth and he is the uh, ruler who is now an adult. Okay, so the uh, the king of the north has just changed. Okay. So with the demise of General Lysias and Antiochus V, the war against the external Seleucid enemy finishes. This is the significance. Right? Judas, Maccabeus, the Jewish people have been fighting against them. When the two of them are removed, this extent, external uh, war finishes. But it's replaced by an internal struggle between the follower of Judah... Judas and the followers of the Greeks. And so with this internal problems in the country. So the influence of the Hellenizers is almost brought to an end when this high priest Menelaus is removed from office and he is actually executed. But as one chapter closes, another opens and another Hellenizer by the name of Alcimus steps up as the next successor. Alcimus is a priest descended from Aaron, the brother of Moses. But even though he is not from the line of high priests, his ironic descent encourages favour from among the Jews in Jerusalem and they accept him as their next high priest or governor as they normally seen. Mandated with power to govern, Alcimus immediately executes 60 priests who oppose him and earns a reputation for cruelty. The Jews of Jerusalem turn on him so he flees with a delegation to Antioch to ask for help from the new Seleucid king, Demetrius I. The king listens as this Hellenic Jewish delegation complain, it is they who are persecuted in Judea, and Alcimus requests an army for protection. Obviously Demetrius, he's just come in to rule this territory, and he's got this revolt that he's been given or inherited, and these people who are representative of him come to him and say, I need help. So what's he going to do? He's going to help them. He's not going to stand with the Jewish people. So the king grants this request and a general called Bacchides is dispatched to Judea with an army. This army is too strong for Judas and his army so he leaves Jerusalem to return to guerrilla warfare and the Seleucids decide that he is no threat. 
Foolishly returning to Antioch, Judas sees the opportunity to return to Jerusalem and overcomes Alcimus. Alcimus flees and returns to Demetrius I in Antioch once again. And so we've got this yo-yoing activity going on. Demetrius agrees a second time to protect Alcimus with the Seleucid army, but this time he appoints the former governor of Cyprus, called General Nicanor, to be their leader because he is known to hate the Jews. Nicanor is not only tasked to kill Judas and settle the dispute between the Hellenic Jews and the Maccabees, but to govern Judea. So in other words, they're not going to let an autonomous rule anymore. They're not going to let a Jewish high priest act as their governor anymore. They're going to send in their own general. So upon arrival, this is all in the second book of Maccabees and the first book of Maccabees, by the way, uh, a lot of this information. So if you want to open those up and have a read of them, you'll, you'll get this information. So upon arrival, General Nicanor tries to catch Judas by treacherous means, but is unsuccessful until a conflict erupts west of Jerusalem called the Battle of Kafar, uh, Kafasalama. Uh, so I'll put up the last image for today. All right. So west of Jerusalem, remember the map's on an angle. Uh, so over here, the Battle of Kafar Salama uh, in this uh, territory. The general loses numerous men and is unable to capture Judas. So he returns to Jerusalem and begins to insult the priests and threaten the destruction of the temple to get a reaction. No matter how much pressure he applies, the priests refuse to reveal how to find Judas. So Nicanor decides to retreat to a strategic roadside town called Beth Haron on a pass between Gibeon and Aelon because he suffers under the tactics of guerrilla warfare. And so this is those places here, Beth Haron, right? and this is Aelon and Gibeon. So he decides to retreat to there. There's another location there that says Adassa. So guess where Judas is hanging out? He's already there, but this fellow doesn't know it. So he basically goes and camps up the road from where Judas already is. Uh, so on the 13th of March in 161 BC, the Battle of Adassa proceeds, and not only is the Seleucid army beaten, but Nicanor is killed, decapitated, has his right hand cut off to be hung on the outside of Jerusalem's wall as a warning to others. So what we get from this, we've been through four battles now, two generals sent down under two different kings, and Judas is not backing off. So in other words, this is no longer a, rev a revolt. Mm -hmm. This is a war. This is a determination to have sovereign rule returned back to their own people again. So that's the big picture of what's actually happening here now. So following this battle, Judea enjoys a time of peace. But after five years of war, the Jews strategically seek an alliance in 161 BC with the only people the Seleucids fear, and that is? The Romans. The Romans, the Roman Republic. So, so these battles are now been going on for five years. They've got this moment to breathe, and so they go, who are we going to get to help us against these uh, Seleucid Greeks? It says, we'll call the Roman Republic. Uh, who's the Roman Republic against? The Seleucids. Remember, they were holding Demetrius, the now king of the Seleucid Empire, as a hostage. And so they would have good reason to get into bed with one another because the Jews now become a buffer between the northern king of the Seleucid Empire and Egypt, who is supplying them with grain. And so you get to see the logic of all of this. So you see what's happening to the Jews. You see the decisions that are made. You see God's hand on all of this and the fulfillment of prophecy. But at the end of the day, they're on the ground. And they're doing what they can. So the Jews want the Greeks out and Judas successfully negotiates what's called the Roman Jewish Treaty the first recorded contract between Rome and Judea. Imagine what he would have thought that looks like a few years later when the Roman Republic turns into the Roman Empire and comes to take over the world. And so this is the precursor to what happens later in history. Okay, so just wrapping up, according to my estimate, the estimates of dates and ages that I'm using for these descendants because they're not... Uh, given uh, a time of life in the genealogy. Eleazar's life comes to an end in this same year, in 161 BC. You might remember I gave them an average age for that period of time of 59 years of age. So 59 years have transpired during all this time. 
So when the Jews of Judea fight for independence from the Seleucid Empire, Demetrius returns from Roman captivity and forcefully takes his position on the throne and inherits the battle the Jews bring against the Seleucid Empire. Greek rule has become so tumultuous, the freedom to worship God by the Jews is challenged along with their character. So what I'm going to say here is that it amazes me to follow the genealogy of Jesus, and this is what part of what we've been doing, and hear how the period of time between the Old and New Testament is known as the... Anyone know what it's called? There's a name given to the period of time. So we read our Bibles, and so abruptly it comes to an end at the end of the Hebrew Bible. There's 400 years of history between then and the New Testament. And so we're in that zone right now, aren't we? There's a name given to this, and it's called the 400 years of silence. So no words, no word of God. This is why the book of Maccabees has been inserted into the silence to give story, to bring truth to what was happening to the Jewish people, the children of God, during this period of time. However, it's not true, is it? There's nothing silent going on here. In fact, there's a lot going on here. It, it marks the end of the Old Testament genealogy and the gap to the New Testament, which starts with genealogy, the genealogy of Jesus. But this time for the Jewish people, including the forefathers of Jesus, is far from silent. Eliezer's story has no content in the Bible, and yet the events that unfold during his life are completely foretold in the book of Daniel. And so that's where we get the whole notion that it's not 400 silent years because Daniel actually speaks, or the book of Daniel, I should say, the word of the Lord is given to Daniel, and it speaks into this time that others call the 400 years of silence. So in other words, what I'm saying is we do know what actually goes on, but we just have to understand it. And by so doing, we look at the book of Maccabees uh, for the Greek period and for the rest of those periods, we look at history to bring life to the story. So powerful and constantly changing rulers have an impact on Eleazar, all of which is revealed through Daniel's extraordinary vision so many years ago. The first and second book of Maccabees are not canonical and are not included in the Hebrew Bible for this reason. But they serve a very useful purpose as a historical resource because they bring to life much of what occurs to the Jews of Judea and support the word of the Lord given by the Archangel Gabriel to explain Daniel's vision. So I encourage you, if you haven't read the books of Maccabees, open up and have a look. I'm not claiming them to be the word of God. We're not claiming them to be canonical, but we are saying that you'll learn all about what happens to God's people during that period of time. So Eleazar lives through the rule of two Ptolemies from Egypt and six Seleucid rulers in Syria. So you can imagine what his life was like. We've done it for, we described it for two weeks now. He's been through eight changes of rulers in one life. That's 59 years. So that's why we call it tumultuous. You imagine what would happen uh, if that happened to us. The biblical kings of the south and the kings of the north in the book of Daniel are those from Egypt and from Syria. He witnesses a regular change of Greek rulers who lead their kingdoms to fight for territorial gain. So at the end of the day, this is what it's about for them. They want to put the Greek empire back together, but under their rule, right? The Jews are caught in the crossfire of all of this. He, they, they murder and depose one another, but the worst is the evil and stern-faced Antiochus IV Epiphanes who slaughters and enslaves thousands of Jews as he attempts to make them worship the false god Zeus rather than the God of Israel. So what we're saying is up until that particular ruler, the Jewish people from the time of Babylonian exile have been free to worship the God of Israel. And so this is a significant shift in what happens. Eleazar endures these dark times and knows that if he abandons God to satisfy Hellenic beliefs, that he will be punished. It is the courage of one Jewish priest who stands against his oppressors, who makes such a difference that a revolt seeking self-determination leads God's people to negotiate with the Romans, who of course are the fourth beast in the visions of Daniel. And on that note, that summary note, uh, we're going to draw to a close tonight. So we are going to move on to the next descendant tomorrow night. And you all know his name? 
No. <laughs> no, you're too, too far forward. It's Methan. Okay. So he is the, uh, the great grandfather. So we're three generations away from Jesus at this point in time. So we're drawing close. Uh, so there's much to learn from tonight's lesson, obviously. We've seen and understood what the abomination of desolation is in the book of Daniel. We've learnt that those prophetic words of periods of time of 1290 days and 1335 days was events that happened then, not now, or in times yet to come. Okay? And so we've been very uh, clear on that point. We're also establishing, and you have to think about this, is what's going on in terms of God's plan for his people. Remember, this works up to the time of the Romans who are in power when Jesus is born. Okay? And of course, that's the fourth beast, the Romans in the prophecies, or the fourth horn, um, or the feet of the statue, whichever of those that you're looking at, you're finding out that this is the fourth stage we're now entering into in the prophecy since the time of Babylonian uh, captivity. So, uh, so we, we're getting there. But think about God's plan. What's it done to his people? So we're at a point now where they're being so oppressed they're determining their true faith in God. They're so oppressed that they're willing to revolt and stand for their God against other people with foreign gods. And so you have to look at that and understand that in their journey and then start thinking about why did Jesus have to come? This is all working all the way from Abraham through to the time of Jesus. Why did Jesus have to come? Why did he come then? Why then? And so when we look at all of these prophecies and we look at the events that lead up to the birth of Jesus, we have to realise that there's a purpose in all of these events that are actually happening. And so therein lies the challenge. We will answer that question as we go along, uh, but we're going to close on that point tonight. So